This last week, my wife and I were cleaning out the garage, uh, which we do on probably a quarterly basis when it gets all cluttered and you move it all out. So we're moving some stuff, and I kind of I had to wiggle the water heater a little bit uh, to move something behind it, and you know continue on. So a little later that morning, we found this giant puddle just you know all over the the floor in the garage, and my wife was like, "What's this?" And I looked up, and sure enough, the water heater is dripping because by wiggling it, I had uh, broken one of the copper lines going to it. Like there's just a, a pinhole leak and it just kind of sprang out and I was like ah so we turn off the water and, and I was like what do you got to do and I was like I'm afraid I'm gonna have to solder that now let me tell you since I've learned to solder like this was like a year ago a friend of mine was like oh yeah here's how you you know sweat the line here's how you you know put the the, the bead of solder in there and it, like any chance to solder something I'm like I'm there <laughs> because it's because it's awesome isn't it? and I, I came in and told my wife I'm like there's not much that makes you feel like a man than soldering some copper pipe. And uh, she laughed at me. But nonetheless, it, I, I soldered the line. And that's that's what NAT is to me. When I first learned how NAT, Network Address Translation, really works behind the scenes, I was like, that's awesome. And, and, and any chance I could get, you know, I'm, I, we'd be at a friend's house and setting up a little Linksys device for them or something to... to route their internet connection. I'm like, you want to know how that works? And they'd always, you know, they'd always kind of look at me like, uh, and I, no, so let me show you. I want to show you how this works because it's amazing. And it, so NAT is one of those cool concepts. And through all the years, it still has not lost its luster. Now, is its time short? Maybe. NAT may fade away someday as IPv6 takes hold, but I will say it is the staple of every network of the world. I, I would challenge you to find me a network in this world that is connected to the internet that is not using NAT. They, they're, they're out there, but I mean, I probably could count them in one hand. So network address translation is what we're all about here. We're going to talk about how it works. Next nugget, we'll talk about how to set it up. Did you know that you could build your own internet? All you have to do is go to your your house and set up a network and then go to your neighbor and say, hey, you want to join my network and connect a cable to his house and then tell him you've got to connect at least five neighbors to you. And so they connect their five neighbors and you kind of start your own little pyramid Amway scheme or something like that and get all, all your neighborhood connected. And before long, it keeps exponentially growing and, and poof, worldwide span, you've got your own internet. Because that's really all the internet is, is just a big network. Instead of houses, it started with some college universities that are like, hey, Let's share some files and you know, four universities connected together and other college campuses were like, hey, let's jump in on that. And then, and then a business partnered in and they jumped in and then, and then dot com came along and someone was like, we can sell stuff here? Woo! And a poof, you know, internet explodes. Everybody needs to be on there. And now it's one of the staples of every business is you have to have an internet connection really anymore to do business in, in most locations. So problem with that is we've now brought masses of devices and masses of equipment and there's a limited scope on the IPv4 address space. As in there's not enough uh, public IP addresses or internet valid IP addresses that are available. So management entities were created and the government got involved and said, okay, we will sell or provision blocks of IP addresses. Like, you know, we'll say the, I'll just throw one out there, 13.1.0.0 slash 16, like that big block of IP address, that's 65,000 IP address. We're going to give that to some service provider. Let's just say at and I'm just throwing one out there, right? So at and gets that, and then they provision it for their customers, and, and you know, somebody signs up for a DSL, I don't even know if at and does DSL, but we'll go with it, a DSL connection from at and and at and says, okay, you can have one of our IP addresses for a limited amount of time that you can use on your different devices. So, I mean, they had to have ways of provisioning and allocating these IP addresses because there are exponentially far more devices in the world today than there are IP addresses. Now, with this management in place, we also had to have something that allowed people to create their own networks. Like you don't want to have to go to some management entity and go, uh, you know, to set up your house and say, hey, I I'd like to use, you know, five computers in my house. Is that okay? I mean, in the same way, I mean, take it, take it this way. You ever bought a, a cordless phone? I mean, I know now with cell phones, right? Everybody's like, whatever. But I mean, cordless phone for your house, right? Um, you don't have to go to the FCC and register for a broadcasting license for your cordless, you know, 900 megahertz phone or whatever kind of phone you have uh, because it is part of the 
unlicensed band. I mean, you are technically broadcasting. You're creating a signal that could interfere with others in the air. But the FCC, meaning the government entity of the United States that, that governs, you know, so nobody can just run their own radio station from home or something like that. They have said that 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5 gigahertz are unmanaged bands. That's why you, you can set up your own little wireless network in your house. You don't have to register for that. So in the same way with IP addresses, they said, we need to let people set up their own networks without actually going to the government and saying, can I do this? Am I allowed? So they came up with private addresses space. I said that totally wrong. Private address space. And you've seen these before, right? 10.0.0.0 through 10.255.255.255. You've got 170, this is a weird one, 172.16.0.0 through 172.31.255.255. Nice little chunk in the middle there. This is class A, this is class B, and then class C, the famous doo -doo -doo -doo, toot the trumpets, 192.168.anything is considered private addresses. So just like private uh, wireless frequencies, we can just use these addresses wherever we want because they're unmanaged. You don't have to have a license to use them. But, but, you know, let's, let's say this is you and your company. Uh, you've, you've, uh, you've created your own little world on, let's just say 192.168.1.0 slash 24. You know, you've got your own little server back here, your own little client. You've got your own little network that's working great, but, the problem is 9 million people in the world are also using, probably 9 billion, <laughs> wait a sec, I'm exceeding the population, but you, you get the point, tons of people are using 192.168.1 in their home because it's unmanaged, so we have to have a way of hiding your network from the world and yet still allowing you to use this public world and that's where NAT comes in, network address translation. At its root, translates from a, well, uh, let me just, you know, the technical definition. Technically translates from one IP address to another, but really the, the, the big picture is it translates from private addresses, which work inside of your house and, and actually would work on the internet if, if service providers would let them through, um, but, but uh, pri it translates from private addresses to public addresses. Now, let me, let me say one more quick thing before we move move on here. Um, one of the biggest misnomers that I've heard, and, and you may have heard this too, I just want to debunk this right now. A lot of people say, oh yeah, those are non-routable IP addresses. Have you ever heard that before? Where, where somebody identifies that those private, they're, oh, those are non-routable IP addresses. Totally not a good way to say it because they work t perfectly fine. I mean, you can set, I mean, ugh, <laughs> ugh, I'm flabbergasted, I'm appalled at that uh, because th this entire series, we've been setting up routing. I mean, it, we, we went in OSPF and set up, you know, these routers on 192.168.1 and two and dot three. And we, we said, okay, this can reach this and, and we're routing those just fine. So if you're gonna say they're non-routable, I would say they're non-routable, but add in there, always add in, on the internet. They're non-routable on the internet. Now, <laughs> even that, I'm like, mm, because if, if they were somehow to get into the internet, they would route just fine. What really happens is to be a service provider, to be an ISP, you are supposed to block, these are all considered RFC 1918. If you ever want to know what is the standard that specifies private addresses, RFC 19, that's the only one I can tell you off the top of my head. Um, but as an ISP, you are supposed to uh, block, the, blo you know, you've got your customer, we'll say over here, uh, that is coming in. You, you are supposed to block all these addresses from getting in. There have been mistakes. ISPs have forgotten to block uh, customer IP addresses and the, and the customer has forgotten to turn on NAT and NAT to what the public address. And there have been cases, you can, you can look them up, to where private IP addresses have gotten into the internet. And it was actually so bad. It was, it was over in Europe somewhere I, I, uh, that I can't, can't quite remember the whole, this is a, a long time ago. But essentially, there was one ISP that forgot to block their customer and all these other ISPs trusted this ISP. So they didn't put the block here because they were like, well, why do we have to block private there? We're assuming, well, assuming that, you know, our ISP friend down there is blocking it. So we don't need to put those blocks here. And they actually had a case where like a whole chunk of Europe went down on the internet because these private addresses had leaked in there. Well, no more. And I'm sure that's taught everybody a, a big lesson. So the, the point is that private addresses route great. 
They just are blocked from getting in from the internet. When you think about NAT, you can think of it as an umbrella of three different flavors. You can have static NAT, very common. Uh, you can have dynamic NAT, uh, which is not very common. Uh, and then you can have something that some people call it NAT overload. Some people call it uh, PAT. That's probably the more common word, port address translation, which is insanely common. Like that, that's the staple that just about every uh, business has. Um, what PAT does, and I'm, I'm going to talk about all three, but I want to talk about the most popular one first because almost every business in the world uses it. What this one does is stretch an IP address further than I'm sure the founding fathers of the internet ever thought it could go. So here's, let me, let me give you the big picture concept of PAT. Uh, so what, every time you have a connection, and this, you know, to understand that, you have to understand how, how devices communicate, right? So, so let's think back, I mean, go back to you know, nugget number five or six of the series, where we're starting to talk about, okay, communication, we've got a source IP address, let's just say uh, 10.1.1.10, uh, and we've got a destination IP address 10.1.1.100, no, no routers in the middle to, to garble this all up, and let's just say this is a web server, this is a client, and I open my web browser uh, and try and access that, what happens? Well, that's where we said, okay, well, the Windows, you know, Windows or Linux or OS X, whatever you're using here, generates a source port number dynamically. It says, okay, I'm coming from the source uh, 1,000, well, let's just do 892. It, it makes those up, and I'm going to a destination. Now, if this is a web server, I'm going to a destination of port 80, right? And, and we, I'm doing a little review here of, of early topics. We call that creating a socket because this says, okay, I'm coming from the source 10.1.1.10 colon 1892, and I'm going to the destination of 10.1.1.100 colon 80. And that when this guy communicates back, he comes from the source of 80 and goes to a destination of 1892. And that's how Windows knows, oh, you're going to this, you know, Google Chrome window or whatever browser uh, we happen to use to browse that. So that's, that's how it works. Now, you can let, let's let's think a little bit further. How many port numbers are there? I mean, we picked eighteen ninety two, but really, how many are there? Well, for TCP and UDP, there's sixty five thousand five hundred and thirty five usable ports uh, that that you're able to work with. You know, outside of I mean, you can get into well known ports and blah blah blah. But I mean, it's sixty five thousand ports. Now, is this a uh, question? Is this computer ever going to tap that out? No, I. No. You know, I'm like, well, I always try and find the exceptions, right? No, it's not because you just can't open enough applications. That computer would crash long before it would, would max those things out. So, so the point is we have all these port numbers that we can use. Okay. Okay. We've established the foundation. Now, here's how Pat works. We have a network. It could be, you know, two clients like we have here. It could be a hundred clients, it could be a thousand clients, whatever uh, we have running inside of our organization. And we've got a router in place. Let's say 192.168.1.1 is the default gateway of these guys. And we've got the public IP address assigned 200.1.1.1. And this, you know, this would actually go to a router of the ISP, whatever ISP you are. Uh, and this default route would point out this way. So when this guy, let's, let's go to this guy, and he opens a web browser. You know, Google Chrome, uh, and and uh, goes to a server out on the internet. We'll just say it is cbtnuggets.com. And I can write. There we go. So he goes to cbtnuggets.com. He's going to automatically, just like we saw over there, generate its own source port number. So he's going to say, okay, Chrome, I'm going to generate source port. Uh, well, I'll, I'll use my diagram. 6,711. That's, that's my source. That's where I'm going to. Uh, to. And I'm going to go to a destination of, let's just say cbtnuggets.com because it's easy to write. It's 1.1.1.1. I'm going to go to a destination of 80. Right there, right? So that request will come into the router that is configured to do PAT, or NAT overload is what Cisco config calls it. Uh, so it, it receives that request and it goes, okay, I'm going to translate you because I know these private addresses do not work on the internet. You know, if I were to send you out as 192.168.50, the ISP would say, eh, and block you and, and you would die right there. So I'm going to translate you to 200.1.1.1. Uh, now, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use your source port number to make you unique. 
You see what happens. So it creates a little table inside, and, and the table is actually bigger than this, but, but it says, okay, the inside address, 192.168.150, it's like a spreadsheet inside the router, is actually going to go to the outside address, 200.111, and it's going to use that same source port number. So, so that way, now it comes out as 200.111 goes to cbtnuggets.com. CBT Nuggets sees it coming from the source of 201.1.1 colon 67.11, and, you know, sends the web page back to that. Uh, it's received here on the router. It goes, oh, okay, well, you're actually going back into this guy. So that's what allows this guy at the same time to open up a different web browser. Well, Chrome, or I'm not talking about like uh, Firefox or anything like that, but let's just say he opens Firefox or Chrome or whatever and goes to the same web. I mean, he could go to cbtnuggets.com. Well, his computer, uh, it, you know, it randomly grabs a port from 65,535 um, and it's going to say, okay, well, I picked port 15396 uh, and I want to go to cbtnuggets.com. So he goes out to cbtnuggets.com. Are you following me here? And I want to make sure you're catching me. So he, he generated his own source port. Windows did that for him behind the scenes. Uh, Nat kicked in and said, okay, I'm going to use that source port number. So as you go through that router, I'm going to translate you to my public address, but I'm going to put a little colon 1536. You, you kind of get why it's called Pat port address translation. It's using the ports to make all these requests look unique. And I'm going to send you to cbtnuggets.com. Now, if cbtnuggets.com gets a, a request from 200111 colon 6711 and gets a second request at the same exact time, let's just say they, they did this at the same time uh, because they both wanted their CBT nuggets, uh, and they it sees a request to 1536, it actually sees these as two unique requests. It doesn't see them as one IP address. It's like, whoa, this must be the same thing. No, it looks at the port number. It's like, oh, I've got two unique requests. So, so okay, in theory, in theory, we're talking theory, we could use this one IP address to service 65,535 computers sitting behind there. You could share that to 65,535 devices in theory. Now, here, let me, let me now... Get to I know I know a lot of you are analytical and you're like okay okay what if let, let me see if I can predict a question rolling around someone's mind I'm, I'm feeling you right now you're going what if one in sixty five thousand chance this computer opens a web browser and goes to CBT Nuggets and at the same time this computer opens a web browser and goes to CBT Nuggets .com, and they just happen to pick the same port number did I, did I read your mind so both of them pick sixty five sixty seven eleven not a big deal. You know, well, how's it not a big deal? What the router does is just say, you know, let's say this guy got there. One of them's going to have to get there first. The packet, can't, you know, the router can't get two packets at the same time. It has to have one in front of the other. So whoever gets there first gets the 6711. When this guy comes in, he's like, oh, I want 6711 too. The router's like, oh, I don't have that. That's all right. I'm going to give you 6712. That's the next free one that I have in my list or, or whatever, the next open port. So these don't have to match. I mean, you, you figure the router's got the big Excel spreadsheet thing going, right? It doesn't have to like, oh, well, oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't have that. No, it's, it's totally fine. So, so it will increment that and life is good. It, you know, this guy, you know, so it's seen from CBT Nuggets is 6712, but when it replies back, he's like, oh, well, 6712 is really 6711, so let me let me send that back to him. So that, that's how it works all out. No no biggie there. Um, and I know we're, I was kind of like stretching it, making it sound like, like ooh, you know, one in 65,000. The truth is this happens all the time, all the time. Because, and, and this is where I go back to the theory, 65,000 devices, it's a theory. Because when you open a device, let me show you. Let me show you this. I'm going to um, open a command prompt. And I'm just going to open a web browser to, uh, oh, how is it, uh, TechNet right there, right? So let's let's go to the biggest waste of time website on the internet, msn.com. Dozens injured after ferry hits New York City dock. Uh, so, you know, when I go here, this isn't just one website. I think I told you this early on in the series, right? I've got a web server that gives you this picture. I've got these these fancy looking ladies. I've got Geico. I've got, I mean, all of this, this web page is just, just uh, an, an assembly of Wow, this is creepy. But but uh, an assembly of uh, this. Uh, you ever see that movie with Will Smith? The um, oh, where the the creature like Argh! that's that's what the guy looks like. Um, so it's an assembly of all kinds of different web pages. So when I go to the command prompt and type in netstat, I actually see uh 
all kind now <laughs> look at this Firefox with Bing that's funny um, so th there's there's all kinds of different servers that I was actually sent to for this one now look at this these are all like my one computer used this and this and this and this and this and this and th I mean these are all source port numbers and it's kind of hanging up the reason it's it's taking a long time is because it's trying to figure out what what uh, well actually because I I clicked in there and it paused but um, it's trying to figure out what name each one of these IP addresses actually resolved to so my one computer uh, actually ended up using I mean the list continues to build right probably I don't know 50 different port numbers just to go to msn.com and see the scary guy in the, in the the scene so the the truth is I mean you in theory if every computer only went to one place and it only used one port number yes we could get the 65,000 but nowadays I mean you're probably with with people web surfing, you could probably stretch this to maybe uh, 300, maybe you know, 500. It depends on your web surfing people. How many people are wasting life on MSN.com uh, versus doing work and all at the same time? And I mean, these things time out after a certain amount of time. So, uh, so it, your mileage may vary, but you can add multiple IP addresses to this pool that when one maxes out on port numbers, the next one jumps in there and takes over. But I, I digress into a lot of the, the specifics. I just want to answer a lot of the questions I know rattle around people's mind when I bring this up. At its root, if I could, if I could clear this off, this is how PAT works. This is how you can use one IP address for many internal ones is by sharing it using the magic of port numbers. Now I have a different slide for static NAT, but let me, let me talk about dynamic really quick because it's similar to PAT, but not really. So uh, so dynamic, what it allows you to do is specify a pool of addresses that we could, we'll just say they're public, and a pool of private addresses. You know, we'll, we'll call it pool private. And what you can do with that is have one-to-one -one translations going through. So let's just say, uh, I say my private pool is 192.168.1.0 through 250. And I say my public pool is actually 200.1.1. Uh, uh, well, let's just say 1 to 250 because you can't use 0. So 1 to 250 over here. So what will happen is, you know, the very first one to go through will get the first address here. Second one to go through will get the second address. It's just a, a series of 1 to 1 links made between the public and private IP addresses. Now, you don't really get any savings. It's not like you save IP addresses when you do this. It's just the reason why it's not used too often. The main place dynamic NAT is used, and it's not something we get into here, is where you have overlapping addresses. So uh, let me give you a scenario. Let's say you've got organization A over here that uses, uh, let's just say, 10. 1.0.0 slash 16. And then you've got organization B over here that uses the same address range, right? Uh, and organization A does a hostile takeover and buys organization B. Uh, so so I don't know why I add hostile into there. It's just part of my nature. <laughs> and so, so what you can do is you can introduce a router in between that uses dynamic NAT to where organization A looks like, we'll just say 10.2.0.0 slash 16 to organization B. And organization B maybe looks like 10.3.0.0 to organization A. So that way you can kind of merge the two and not re they don't really know they have have overlapping addresses because NAT is hiding it with this uh, this pool. You create a pool of addresses in 10.2 and then Matt line it up to organization A and create a pool in 10.3 and line it up to organization B. So that's that's where you see dynamic NAT used and it's only used temporarily. Obviously that situation doesn't want to hang around for any amount of time. So the last form of NAT that I want to talk about is static NAT. And this one is used all the time. So we've got you know PAT which is used everywhere uh, and then we have static NAT which is used uh, all over the place. A static NAT is a one-to-one -one mapping uh, from the inside to outside that doesn't change. As you saw before with PAT, you know, these, these little port number deals that we're running where, you know, this guy opens up a web browser and accesses Cisco.com, you know, he uses this port number. Well, as soon as he closes his web browser, that session dies and that NAT port ends up back into the pool to where it can be used by anybody again, right? But there's times where you want to create a one-to-one -one mapping. Maybe I say this one is always mapped to the IP address 200.1.1.2, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the ISP believes you have that address because they've given it to you. So, so when, when somebody, you know, this is usually, let's say this one is actually an email server, right? 
So when you're running an email server in an organization, uh, emails are coming in from all over the world, and they need to be able to reach uh, your your uh, router. Now, how would they know to come here? How would all the emails know to come right here? Well, you would go to a DNS server. Let's say let's say your organization is uh, a NuggetLab.com. Well, what you would do is wherever you registered that domain, you would go to the DNS control panel and create an MX record, uh, which is a mail exchange. And you would say, okay, anytime somebody sends me mail, send it to you know 200.1.1.2. So that that you know the mail servers look up that MX record. They would end up here, and you would create a static NAT mapping that says 200.1.1.2 really maps to my email server at 192.168. Uh, 1.51. So this is usually used for inbound, you know, to where uh, things coming in. But now, anytime this one goes out, uh, he will also go out as 200.1.1.2. He doesn't go into the general pool over here. Now you can use static NAT uh, f as a one-to-one -one IP address, or you can even break it down further. You could say 200.1.1.2 on port 25 maps to this email server on port 25. So, uh, by the way, port 25 is SMTP. Uh, that's what email servers use when they receive email. So that allows you to just say, just that port maps to that email server. Why is that good? Because public IP addresses are at a premium, you know, you, you want to conserve them as much as possible. So you might be, be able to, you know, use that for other things. You might say, well, 200.1.1.2 colon 80, you know, uh, HTTP services. Those will actually go to a third server inside of here. Maybe it's, we've got a server 192.168.1.100. And that's our web server that we're running. So if somebody accesses web services, it actually goes to that 192.168.1.100 on port 80. Uh, and I can now kind of split this IP address into all these different services. You know, you, you say, oh, well, actually, I also want to send 200.1.1.2 colon 443, which is HTTPS, to that same destination. So you can, you can really split this up, you know, give it the whole IP address per server, or you can break it down and say, well, these ports go to these different servers and really get the most out of each IP address. Those are the concepts. It, if, if it's at all fuzzy right now, and hopefully it's not, but if it is, uh, it'll get much clearer when we start doing the configuration in the next nugget. So let's review. We have seen what network address translation is. We've seen there's many ways to go public to private, and we saw the, the static way, the dynamic way, and then using PAT uh, as, a, as a way to uh, do it. Almost everybody in the world using PAT almost every business in the world using static NAT uh, to make servers available from the inside out. And then we saw some, I'll say some of the NAT terms and locations. Uh, we saw the, the inside, the outside uh, uh, addresses, but when we get into the configuration, you might remember I said there's, there's actually more to this, where we get into things known as inside local addresses and inside global addresses. You'll, you'll, you'll start being able to identify where these different IP addresses are in the grand scheme of things. But that's in the configuration. So for now, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.